This is Tech Talk Today, episode 274. Welcome into Tech Talk Today, episode 274, live from Linux Fest Northwest 2018, the premier Pacific Northwest Linux Fest. My name is Chris. I'm Angela. And with us is... Alan G. Hello, Alan. Thank you for joining us here at the booth. We're doing it live here on the floor of Linux Fest. We wanted to get together here as a group and do a little, a little story from here to there. And to make it just perfect, the icing on the top, Mr. Chase is joining us too. Hello, buddy. Thanks for running the board for us. Yeah. Well, wow, wow, wow. I'm here. Yeah. It's amazing. It's, it's a, it's it's a big weird. production. Yes. So it is. It's good to be here. Let's get right into our first story this week. There is no better place to cover this first story. It's perfect. We're live at Linux Fest Northwest. Everything Linux. So let's talk about the next major version of Windows. <laughs> <laughs> it's launching on Monday as we record this on a Saturday. The April update, which will be out just under the wire, April 30th, <laughs> uh, with a broader rollout starting May 8th. And of course, there's going to be lots of cosmetic changes and bug fixes and whatnot, but Microsoft's making a big deal out of this new timeline feature. Um, and the overall idea of timeline is you are jumping between mobile and desktop all day long, Microsoft says. And it's hard to pick up right where you've left off. Go between your devices is difficult for your small mind. And now, with timeline, Windows 10 will attempt to do what nobody could do before. Whether you're on Edge or an Office 365, on Android or a Windows machine, timeline will be built right into the task manager and allow you to jump right back into that document you were working on on that laptop at home or on that Android device. That just sounds like what like Google Docs has done. And also, um, there's handoff on Apple devices. Right, yeah. So it, it's been done before. Or like, you know, sync my tabs between my Firefox and my phone and on my desktop. Yeah. Which I do all the time. Yeah. I mean, the feature could be kind of useful, like if you could legitimately, like, go to your star menu or something and see it like at you know 11 30 p.m you were working on this document because that is how some people's brain works right is they think oh i was doing this spreadsheet around lunchtime and you could pop right back into that I, maybe i guess maybe if it was on the start menu in somewhere in there there's a section where it shows all the things that are open on my phone and i can click on one of yeah. them and have it open on my desktop yeah right. but at the same time that just means giving microsoft access to every one of my devices well it also feels Although like i've already you know submitted to google so well do you need to do <laughs> another one not necessarily it also feels like one of those things that would be much more feasible if uh, microsoft owned the mobile market and now it, with android you're going to have to use their apps mm -hmm. which is a not a always compelling solution on Android. It is yep. for some people, but not everybody. So it seems like without their stranglehold that they used to have on the market, features like this are a little bit less compelling. That and also Dropbox basically eliminated or attempted to eliminate this need because um, you would save it, you know? Mm -hmm. But I guess maybe Microsoft is thinking people will just leave it open and not save? Like, I don't know. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. so how about the Windows 10 feature that actually could be kind of useful for me? Um, not switching for it, but I think it's interesting. They're highlighting something called Focus Assist, which will mute your notifications. You can set it to automatically mm. mute notifications at specific times and turn on at will. That feels very appealing to me because here at the floor, my Wi-Fi has been coming and going, and so all of a sudden I've been getting stacked notifications where my whole yes. boop, 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 and I'm like, whoa, 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 and if I could just have them all off. Well, let's just be real. Anything that will help you with your focus would be good for you, <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's true. Well, it's kind of like a do not disturb, though. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, essentially. It's, again, not new. Which is like it's adaptive. Like it, yes. It, you well, don't have it, to manually turn it on and off. You can choose to have it uh, also let like certain emails and callers come in, so yeah. it's like more than just D&D &D, because it's like selective. Right, I've, I've, I very much liked the, the newer D and D features on the Google phone. First of all, when I you know I go to watch a movie and I set it you know don't beep during the movie, but if it now that you can say you know and turn off after four hours because before it'd be like two days later before oh, yeah. I realized my phone has been on do not disturb for three days. Yes. Right, and yes. actually um, the iPhone just had that uh, when you turn off Wi Fi, mm -hmm. it says we'll turn, turn off Wi Fi and turn it back on tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Right, and and the uh, <laughs> the do not serve feature also has you know if somebody calls me three times in a row mm -hmm. break through yes and right. you know if they're if, if the contact has a star in my contact list right. they're allowed to wake me up right yep, yep. I like that so you mentioned iPhone let's do an iPhone story we have been following Gray Shift and their Gray Key for weeks on this show and um, this is a doozy someone is extorting Gray Shift with quote unquote leaked source code and they're asking for wow. fifteen thousand dollars in ransom. 
which is the That's, price of the great but the, in the form of a bitcoin i think i didn't two bitcoin oh two bitcoins yeah, yeah. they want two bitcoin yep wow yeah. uh the code itself doesn't appear to be particularly sensitive though uh so gray shift kind of came out and said well you see, we were working with a customer and their firewall was misconfigured because they require, uh, they require that you open up a port on their firewall so they can connect to the device. So, of course, somebody screwed that up, setting that up, and they just they, they, they opened it up to the whole world. And uh, so somebody got the login page of the device and its CSS and it's that, the code for that login page. Uh, and they say, we are a business group looking, uh, looking forward to bring your into your attention the fact that we have obtained the source code for your product gray key and would appreciate any donation above two bitcoin and the message goes on uh, they they say that uh, they also are willing to do something like if somebody wants to bid a lot more they'll just release it to the public oh wow yeah uh, I remember the shadow brokers doing something like that. Right? Yep, I, I thought that same thing hmm. uh, and and gray key of course is trying to play it down. But it's it's so funny because we've talked about well, sure. In the next iOS, Apple's just going to make this thing a brick. Yep. Uh, but, but a fifteen thousand dollar brick. Uh, let's mention Ting. Last.ting.com because we were just talking about mobile. Seems like a good time to do it. Ting is sponsoring our live show. Last.ting.com. Take twenty five dollars off a device when you go to last.ting.com or get twenty five dollars in service credit. Ting is mobile that makes sense. You just pay for what you use: your minutes, your messages, and your megabytes. Now, sometimes, like when we're at a big event, we may use a little bit more data, so we'll pay a little bit more that month. But the next month, it goes back to just about thirty something, thirty eight, forty bucks a month. And it really works out so well over those other 11 months that I, I think I've been with Ting now for four or five years. Mm -hmm. yeah, a long time. Yep. Yeah. Wow, that's so great. Mobile that makes sense. Yeah, you just pay for what you use, your minutes, your messages, and your megabytes. Whatever you use, that's how much you pay. It's $6 for the line. You can have CDMA or GSM networks, and whatever works better in your area, you just pick that network. They have great customer service. Check them out at last.ting.com. It's really a better way to do mobile. And if you've got Wi-Fi at work and Wi-Fi at home, woo. Why are you not doing this? Last.ting.com. Lots of people talking about Eric Lundgren. How do you think you say that last name? Lundgren. Lundgren? Okay. Uh, he's an e-waste recycler, and he lost a big, big battle with the U.S. government over selling counterfeit Microsoft restoration CDs. Not full copies of Windows themselves, because you had to have the OEM key on your machine to use the software. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was getting these manufactured in China, bringing them into the states. He was, according to Microsoft and the uh, US government, going to a lot of lengths to make them look like legitimate restoration CDs, charging about $1.75 per disc. So he's not trying to make a bunch of money here. He says, Eric says, that his big goal was to just prevent people from throwing away their entire PCs because they lost their Windows restoration discs, mm -hmm. or they never had them. Right. Yeah. Uh, and he says, you know, when I'm doing e-cycling, e e e-recycling, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't believe how many functional computers I was finding in landfills that just didn't have license because maybe the hard drive died or something. Yep. So he was trying, he says, to make a restore disk that he could sell to like computer repair shops and customers. Uh, and when, when, the, uh, when the courts first started going after him, they came after him with a massive fine saying that, uh, that each disk was worth $300 because they didn't understand the difference between a restoration CD and the full license of Windows. Right. Like right. a commercial version. Yeah. Or the, a retail box. Right. Microsoft um, wrote a letter to the court and kind of said, well, those are restored CDs, so those are only worth $25. So they kind of helped him out in a big way, but they didn't tell him to toss the court out, mm -hmm. case out. Microsoft has gotten a whole bunch of shit for this. A lot of people that are breathing down Microsoft's throat, so their chief like marketing guy came out today and posted some of the emails that show where Eric was traveling to China to make sure the molds would be just right for the, for the, to make everything look right and talking about being able to raise the prices and stuff like that. And nothing in it seems damning to me, but they're trying to make the case that, you know, we didn't bring the case against this guy. The U.S. government did when he was coming in through um, the border. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's when they caught him with all this stuff. And they said, this is counterfeit software. You're doing, you know, computer abuse and fraud. And we didn't start. We didn't bring this case, and we tried to help him out. But you know, and he posted one of the emails. He's like, "Here, you read the emails. You decide for yourselves." Microsoft's trying to trying to absolve themselves from from wrongdoing in this case in the public eye. Uh, but it it does seem extremely excessive. Yeah. The guy overall is putting the blame. Eric, he's putting the blame on Microsoft. Uh, he says that they could have stepped up more. But I don't know. What do you think, Alan? You know, it, 
he did break a law. It is kind of a silly law, but you know, in the end, because he was trying to sell them, not maybe just recoup the cost of the blank CD or whatever, and trying to make them look legitimate, it that's I think what screwed him over. Yeah. Uh, in, if, intent. If he, yeah. yeah. If, if he'd make you know, it look were, like just burned discs. Well, or if if the fancy label on it said you know Eric's restore CD, not mm -hmm. trying to have the hologram kind of thing, mm -hmm. uh, then he might have stood a better chance of of not getting in so much trouble. You also see in the emails where they're talking about the the market value of XP SP3 CDs and Win7 CDs. Like these have the most market value. We think we'll have many years of profit or at least another solid year of profit off these. You know, you uh, when you you're but the guy's trying to run a business at the same time. I mean, you don't want the business to close. You can't give away something that and it does keep computers out of the landfill. So what do you think? Well, like, yeah, uh, I I definitely understand the desire here because Every laptop I've ever bought has never come with a restore CD. Mm. And I've always been hesitant to completely erase the windows off it in case I ever need it for something. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, you yeah. know, I don't want to have to mess around with trying right. to get the right thing. And, and often you actually need a specific uh, type of restore CD, not like a, a retail box CD will not let you install with one of those uh, issued by the OEM uh, license keys because they're tied to like the BIOS and you have to have the right strings or whatever. Yeah. So like when I used to have the MSDN AA when I was in college and when I was teaching and I would get free licenses, uh, if I used that CD and tried to fix somebody's computer that had, you know, just using the genuine Windows sticker on the Dell, um, it wouldn't install because it wasn't the right kind of CD to match up. Right. Mm. So I understand the desire to have that. Uh, yep. But, you know, they're really strict with the counterfeit stuff. Uh, I got a, a, a warning a, a couple of months ago. Um, you know, if you have, uh, like, TSA PreCheck or uh, Global Entry, uh, you, because that's a, a program the government decides that you're allowed to have and they can revoke it any time for any reason, yeah. buying counterfeit stuff off Amazon is enough to violate... You, you violated custom laws by buying a, knowingly buying a counterfeit, so we're taking away your trusted traveler status. Wow. 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 What do you think, Ange? Is this, do they come down too hard on this guy? I, I am not sure why Microsoft isn't launching this as their new thing. Like, can they just, what? Because like, they want you to buy out? Windows 10. He well, says, no, he makes sure, I understand that, but taking the whole envir environmental aspect, it seems like now is like the right time to do that. Yeah. And why not? Yeah. So. Yeah. Like, let us help you restore your old or, PC. Or, yeah. You know, yeah. Why, why and also, it? here's Windows 10. Or Microsoft could make the recovery CD thing as something you can download to a USB stick from yeah. the internet oh, for free from Microsoft. 100% they like could. You, you bought a computer, you, you have to have a license key that yeah, works. right. And maybe we make it only he, OEM license keys, he, not retail ones. So Eric argues that uh, the issue is these end users aren't even aware that this stuff exists, period. So mm -hmm. they don't know to even go look for it, so they just right. get frustrated and toss the computer out. Right. Um, I, you know, Sounds he, like what my mom did. Yeah, it, it does sound like something that people just don't really have any, any even, even know how to Google, right? They don't even well, know how to Google the problem. Well, don't users, though, don't they go to the manufacturer's website to try to find a recovery CD and a, I don't or know. a recovery image or something? He I, argues I've done they it, don't. I've done it many times. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. I think and we. Yeah, we I have, definitely see. Yeah. You know, Dell is more interested in selling you a new computer. That's than what Eric says. Yeah. Eric says that there is a profit stream around like these computers having to get aged out, and mm -hmm. that they want to make new sales, and they want them on the new stuff. Yes, and our live audience points out, you know. Uh, from the recycling perspective, is Linux or BSD not the right answer for this? Well, that's so true. You know, <laughs> if, I mean, if all the people do on the computer is browse the web and, and email and so on. I've always felt like we could have a real grassroots um, community, cross-community sort of like push for lugs or something to do that. And some lugs take that on, but like mm -hmm. there was, if just wish there was a broader effort there. Sure. Because especially now, uh, you know, well, yeah, things have changed so much over the last couple of years that you know everything's just a web browser. And and w even even a two core system, it could be ten years old now. It's still plenty fast. So yeah, and like we see with the the Chromebook, you you don't need much more than a mm -hmm. web browser to have basically yep. a whole computer now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not like in the older days where you know oh there's a bunch of Windows apps that they're going to need or you know they need something. Uh, you know, back when like LibreOffice and OpenOffice weren't actually able to open most uh, Word right. documents and stuff that right. you might get. Yep. I mean, most people too would just be happy with something they could run in the browser. Really, they don't care. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, like a pig in mud, right? Yeah. <laughs> like a pig in mud. Speaking of pigs, researchers are keeping pig brains alive outside the body. Mm -hmm. How about this for a story? The work was described on March 28th at a meeting held at the National Institutes of Health to investigate ethical issues arising as U.S. Neuroscience centers explore the limits of brain science. 
During an event, Yale University neuroscientist Neon Siastian disclosed that the team that leads an experiment on between 100 and 200 pig brains obtained from a slaughterhouse restored circulation using a system of pumps, heaters, and bags of artificial blood warmed to body temperature. There was no evidence that the disembodied pig brains regained consciousness, however. They did think that it was at least mind-boggling and unexpected that billions of individual cells in the brains began to get formed again and were healthy and capable of normal activity. So, uh, it turns out this wasn't supposed to come out yet. They were going to be submitting a paper to, uh, to a medical journal, and uh, this guy was r- running his mouth at an event much like this, at, a, at, a, at an event only for doctors, mm-hmm. and said, yeah, we got pig brains in jars. Um, and so the surgeons had already kind of, after they heard that, they started looking around, they said, well, um, there could be some legitimate medical uses here, but there's obvious moral issues with disembodied human brains, yeah. and we don't want them to become guinea pigs for testing exotic cancer cures and things like that. But we do think there is potential here to try like some crazy Alzheimer's cure mm. on a mm-hmm. brain in a jar. Um, however, they're not, they're not calling it brain in a jar. I'm a little disappointed. I think they should. They're calling it brain in a bucket. <laughs> it's alliterative, so it works. Yeah. Brain in a bucket. I guess as if they, as long as if they go to humans, yeah, it's kind of like the football players, the NFL. That you know they're doing the the brain mm-hmm. uh, stuff, like they're donating their brain after they die. I was just gonna say organ donors. I it, mean, it, I mean, if they want to yeah. put it towards science, go for it. Yeah, but okay, but think definitely about that. Definitely needs to be opt in and yeah, think, op- definitely. Before you opt in, you kind of want to know what they're gonna do with it. Yeah, well, because what if they, you do? They re- might decide to do something really back? embarrassing. What if you come back? They just <laughs> like think about that. Yeah. What if you wake up? <laughs> you would be in the, the weirdest sensory deprivation chamber of all time. You'd have no ears, no eyes, no way to communicate. You might be able to remember stuff, but you'd have no legal rights. You're in the next right. dimension. Yeah. And, and, you know, what are they testing on you? <laughs> and, you know, yeah. at some point, it's yeah. something embarrassing. Plus, the other issue is, is like, uh, it's not quite clear if the tissue is still alive, even if it's not part of the body. There's right. like a whole bunch of... Does that mean you were never actually dead? And this does that mean weird. you still have to pay taxes? This That's is getting weird. Yeah, yeah. taxes, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Okay. I think I'm going to So now only taxes are for sure. Not death, but taxes <laughs> yes, are for sure. Oh, my gosh. So, so what defines you as human then at that point? Yeah, exactly. They yeah. said that they use synthetic blood, and uh, but did it mention anything about using stem cells or, or something else to repair and you know, rejuvenate the cells? I didn't go all the way through because they do go into some future stuff. This thing is uh, several pages long, and we'll have it linked at techtalk.today slash 274. Um, Because they had later on, they do kind of talk about like future stuff, uh, the comatose state, kind of how it works, and future brain experiments that they want to do. So it's worth a read. I don't know if they get into stem cells, but yeah, you got to wonder, right? Piggybacking. Oh, pig. Okay. Piggybacking on this story, though, um, there was a guy who had uh, a bad body condition and he was paralyzed and he was going to have his head cut off and transplanted. Right, and it's it was like a t- at least a, t- a one and a half to two year thing, and it was supposed to happen December 2017, and uh, I had mentioned it to our son, and um, he asked me about it the other day, and turns out the guy decided that because the doctor couldn't tell him for sure that he would survive, he didn't want to have his head transplanted to a functional body. Well, of course, the doctor they had. I know, right? So, the, but their plan was to sever his spinal cord very, you know, precisely and then reattach it in a, like, 20-hour surgery and see if he could, you know, use this new body because his body was failing him. Hmm. But he decided to bail. So that's no longer a thing if you heard anything about well, the first head bummer. transplant. Well, that's bummer. Way to bum me out. I was all psyched. Uh, <laughs> maybe, if they, maybe in the future they can move into a robot body. So uh, there is this website called yeah. GED Match. If you're familiar with this, it's kind of like no. 23andMe, only it's like oh. an open, uh, you self-volunteer, there's no fee. Cool. Well, you think, but well, let's see what you think after this. Uh, a tiny little uh, DNA analysis from? from GED Match was used to catch the Golden State Killer. Now, I'll get into this in a second, but uh, so the Golden State Killer, he's, he's been around, he ran... He ran around from 1976 to 1986 in central and southern and northern California. Um, and they finally caught him in the Yolo County. And so he's there at, in the Yolo courts. And uh, the, the cops didn't use any of the big DNA branding analysis firms like 23andMe. They went to the free and open source site run by, small two, by a small business and by two different gentlemen in Florida. 
who just take donations via PayPal. And according to the East Bay Times, which first reported the connection between GED Match late Thursday evening and California investigators, they got a huge break in the case when they matched DNA from some of the original crime scenes with genetic data they'd already been uploaded to GED Match. Now, the thing is, is he didn't go and, like, upload his own DNA, and victims didn't go and upload their own DNA, but their family members did. Mm -hmm. And so they were able to use that. Uh, the GED Match uh, business had no idea that the cops were using this. They had, they had no clue. It's like uh, we would charge extra for that. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, yeah, so they say because you and your relatives share and, and your ancestors share the common DNA, there's parts of it that will inherit chromosomes, which are large single molecules of DNA. Over time, these molecules will gradually exchange segments with chromosomes inherited from other individuals, but it's a slow process. So stretches of your ancestors' original chromosomes are preserved for many generations when you get a DNA test. And so even if it was somebody who was alive a generation or two ago, they still got a match. Yep. Actually, uh, so I mentioned this, I think, on a previous Tech Talk today, that there's some people that order the 23andMe DNA test, and they submit, like, a false name, thinking that they're getting away with anonymity, and they're not, because if as soon as another relative close by does it, bam, you're pegged. Yeah, yeah. and and I think, like, in this case, uh, the 23andMe database has been subpoenaed before, and, you know, you're not so, as protected as you hope. So you need everybody in your family to use fake names is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As, as soon as, as, soon as of one of them doesn't. A then, family of spies. Well, your worst case is somebody in your family has already done it. And mm -hmm. so you're already screwed. Yeah, maybe. Yep. You know, what? You know though, everything you do is, is peril with all kinds of problems. Uh, let's talk online dating for a moment. You probably have thought about maybe the person you could be talking to on an online dating app is not really a man or a woman, as they say. That's always a possibility. Sure. But did you ever really think that it might be a PR person, like a hired PR person? This is becoming a real thing. You could be flirting on dating apps with paid impersonators. And this is a, Q a QZ article, a Quartz.com article I've linked in the show notes. Every morning I wake up to the same routine. I log into a Tinder account of a 45-year-old man from Texas, a client. I flirt with every woman in his queue for 10 minutes, sending their photos and locations to a central database of potential opportunities. For every phone number I get, I make a $1.75. <laughs> so crazy. Yeah, isn't that weird? So the point is to harvest data from people that are dating. And then wh I, what's, what do they do with it? Well, you got to also... you I. Hmm. Yeah, that's it. I, what, I what happens to that database? That's a good question. I haven't. Yeah, I don't well, know. See, I see this differently. I say, let's say you are a busy Wall Street right. professional, and you still want to get laid, <laughs> and you want to meet that special someone. Just hire right? a hooker. And you know, you know how long it takes for you. I, I mean, I know what you swiping some direction, right? <laughs> Right, yeah. and, and you know, Who's got time to swipe? And, and, and you're, you're typing all day and your thumb is hurting. You just hire somebody else to do that. You go to Fiverr or something and yeah. you know just let somebody else do it. Well, they're supposed, to be, they're supposed to be selling the best you. So they're your photos yeah. and your stories, yeah. okay. but they're selling the best you. So that's kind of great because the dating apps are such poor quality that you want to get out of them as soon as possible. Yeah, that's true. And so getting a phone number is actually not that hard. Well, you could, so the other thing you could do is you could just make it a career and become what they call a closer. You just go in for initial training that lasts several weeks. Then you get access to the client's account. You read training manuals. They have drafts of fake things. They give, they'll even make you have fake matches so you can learn how to court somebody. So you could do this professionally and make a little money. Rather be a fixer than a closer. Yes. My closers... <laughs> You could have your different. You could have. You could have. In fact, some people have several closers at a time. Wow! Several closers at a time. Are you talking about like a lefty righty thing? Are yeah. we talking baseball here yeah. now? Yeah. You, know, you need to have a lefty. You got to spread. In. You got to play the field, Chase. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of fish. I'm, I've missed this. I don't. I can't even <laughs> with this. This is too much. Like yeah. now, because I miss AOL. You're missing out on like the most important AOL. part, like the early days of a relationship. Like if you if you outsource the first few conversations of your relationship, like what's that say about your relationship? <laughs> Yeah, yep. and, and how are you going to make the later conversation? They're referencing something like that's all. Yeah. Remember that? Well, they oh, probably that review me. it. They probably yeah. review like, yeah. oh, yeah, you told sure. them this. Remember <laughs> when we talked about my dog? I didn't know you had a dog. You know, it's. <laughs> or what if they actually Oops. send like the wrong picture? You know, because they got several people they're closing for. I don't yeah. know. Link in the show notes if you want to read that. Is there a link to the like a job application? <laughs> <laughs> you could probably find one. Yeah, I'm maybe. pretty charming in text. So. Scrolling down to the bottom of it, I don't see it. Sorry, you'll have to Google that one. Okay. A dollar seventy-five. You better be working hard though. If you're only making a dollar yeah, seventy-five per 
that's the gig economy for you. Yeah, boy, that's no good. I could, I could get an app for more than that. So is there anything else we want to mention before we get out of this live tech talk? Linux Fest Northwest, by the time you're hearing this, will be wrapped up probably. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we'll have some coverage in our other shows. So you can check those out. Mm-hmm. Um, anything else? Uh, you can follow uh, Mr. Jude on Twitter. Yep. You are Alan Jude. Alan Jude, yep. And uh, at Andrews, I'm at Chris Les. Chase is... At Nunes, N-U-N-E-S. There you go. And this, the whole network is at Jupiter Signal. Links to everything we talked about. Tech Talk Today slash 274. And uh, you'll also find subscribe links there if you want to get the rest of Season 2. Season 2 is in mid-swing now. Yep. It's like swing-ish. And we'd love your feedback on if you enjoyed this live episode event or mm-hmm. if maybe maybe you don't care for the background noise. Who yeah, knows? Maybe. It's kind of cool. Also, but we should mention explain your job badly. Today slash contact. Give us a bad explanation of what you do for a living. We'll be reading some of those on a show very soon. Yep. That sounds like so, fun. For yeah. example, I record conversations with my ex-husband and then publish it for the entertainment of the world. There you go. So what is your job Explain it to us badly, techtalk.today slash contact. Thanks so much for joining us, and we'll see you back here soon. Soon. At the end of next week. Yeah. Yeah. Soon. It's just soon. (laughs) 